All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for sticking with me till the bitter end of today. Uh, welcome to my talk, The Spy Who Liked Me. Most of you in this audience are probably way too young to remember this particular movie, but hopefully you know who that is. It's James Bond. There's a new one now. I hear he's very cool. So we're gonna talk about how we groom and recruit assets for foreign intelligence services using social media. There's a very big delay. There we go, okay. Uh, content warning. For those of you who are sensitive, there are large themes of terrorism, large themes of violence in this particular talk. If you're uncomfortable with those things, if those things are upsetting to you, you're not gonna hurt my feelings if you need to walk away. I completely understand. As a veteran myself of the US military, I completely understand how those things can be upsetting. All right, so a little bit about me. My name's Tracy. Uh, I decided to join the Air Force when I was 19 for reasons I still don't fully understand, but uh, that happened. And then when I got out, it turns out that I was very well suited to doing military work. So I went to protect our nation's uh, missile defense program. So for those of you who aren't familiar, that's the big things that go up in the sky and shoot other things out of the sky. That's, that's what I did for a long time. And then after that, I got accepted to go to NATO uh, here in Europe, up in Belgium. Uh, and I was working as the information security manager for NATO counterintelligence. Once I decided that the government was really cool, but I was terribly underpaid, I decided to go to private, and I ended up getting a job at Microsoft doing incident response. I moved from there to Google, Adobe, and then now I run an organization called DefendCon, which is targeted towards getting more women and non-binary individuals into technical cybersecurity roles. So that's a really long way of saying I've done a lot of really weird stuff in my career, but I'm gonna to talk to you about one of them. So this is the talk, this is the quote that I like to use uh, to start all my talks, uh, Bruce Shiner. He's a technologist, a security uh, person who's been in our industry for a really long time really well-known, super solid guy. And he says, amateurs hack systems, but professionals hack people. So what does that, that really mean? That doesn't mean that our, our colleagues in the red team, our colleagues in the blue team that do these really cool esoteric hacks are any less professional. It means that humans as a species are fairly lazy. We have evolved to do low friction activities for high reward gains. That means that the best thing I can do with my time is not to spend four months researching a specific exploit for a specific server in a specific country or in a specific company. It's really to see if I can get other people to do my work for me. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So this talk, we speak about OSINT, or Open Sources Intelligence. We talk about human intelligence. And we also talk about foreign intelligence services. And in this particular context, I'm using foreign in the sense of foreign to the United States, which I understand is a very US-centric space to be in, but I promise there's a tie-in. I promise, stick with me to the end. I promise it's relevant. All right, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about tools. There are a, a lot of really good tools talks um, that you can see on YouTube, that you can see uh, layer eight conferences coming up. Social Engineering Village at DEF CON has a lot of great stuff. Um, I do use them, but this is not that talk. So uh, for those of you who are expe expecting to see a lot of super cool technical code dropping, this is not your talk. I'm gonna talk more about how we do it and the methodology we do it and where this comes from. My disclaimers, my warnings. Um, I'm not a spy. Now or ever, have I ever been a spy? And someone at this point in the audience usually points out but Tracy, that's exactly what a spy would say. You understand my conundrum. So what does this mean and why do I say it? It means that I was never a badged or credentialed agent. So I worked for counterintelligence. I did not work in counterintelligence. Why is this important? Because if I had worked in counterintelligence, I could not give this talk. Because then that information would not be my own independent research that I used to get here. Um, so these, which leads me to my next point. Everything you hear today is my opinion. This is how I would target people. This is how I've observed different nation state attacks going on in the news. They are not the viewpoints of my employer, past, present, or future, the US government, any of the agencies I've mentioned probably don't really even want me speaking on this. So they're just me. 
So let's get some definitions. Open source is intelligence. What that means is I don't need to be working at the NSA, the CIA, um, Interpol, whatever, to get access to it. Generally, we use this to speak about things I can find on the internet nowadays. But in reality, it's often things I can find in a library, in municipal records. There's a lot of ways you can get open sources intelligence that are off the grid, so to speak. When I talk about human, I'm talking about what we would traditionally consider spy work, human intelligence. That's the me approaching you to figure out how you work so I can get something out of it. Coincidentally, social engineering is the same thing, but it's morphed into a way of doing this in the IT world and in the hacking world, largely to use deception to get something that I want out of a target or an asset. So OSINT and InfoSec is usually used um, as part of a red team exercise. Uh, it helps me map a network. So if I am going to go attack Airbus, I'm going to want to know what their network looks like, what their technology stack looks like. And I can do that by do basically Google dorking through the internet, um, just kind of doing some soft probing. Because servers, when I ask them what they are, are usually very kind enough to tell me, especially if they're web facing. So that helps me figure out what technology stack they're using and how I can actually target them. It helps me improve the odds of social engineering exercises. That means if I know that you are a huge Manchester United fan, by the way, I know nothing about football, so don't, I picked that out of thin air. Sorry to anyone who's not a Manchester United fan. I can come up to you and strike up a conversation and say, hey, that was a great game last night, huh? Man, that goalie, really, he did a good job. And you can say, that's right, Manchester United forever. And now we have a bond, and now we're friends because we have a common framework to engage. And that means that now that you start to see me as one of you, you're going to be more willing to do things for me. Because as humans, we are tribal by nature. We seek out connection. We crave it. We need it in order to survive in the world. So we are constantly looking for those indicators that you are the same as me or you are different than me. You are either in my tribe or you are an outsider to my tribe. So when I speak about OSINT, I'm specifically talking about this last one, which is I want to gather information on people with the intention of exploiting it. If you have information that I want, I want you to give it to me. And I want you to be glad to give it to me. All right, so the origins of this talk. Uh, while I was stationed at NATO, uh, there was a shooting at Frankfurt Air uh, Airport. It was part of a troop movement. By the way, this is the content warning I gave you earlier. This is as bad as it gets, though. So if you can stick through this slide, it's going to improve. Uh, basically, we had an incident where uh, an individual went into a troop movement bus, shot a bunch of airmen. Many of them died. Um, and it, it really caused sort of a big stir, especially in the overseas military uh, community, because it was the first time, I think, that we felt like we couldn't be safe where we were stationed in Europe, because Europe has always been largely friendly to us since the Second World War. Um, so I started really thinking about this. So what, how, did this, how did this happen? Well, it turns out that we take these Bluebird buses that are manufactured predominantly in America. They look, I mean, they stick out everywhere. We parked them in the same spot in the same airport every time we went to go get a troop movement. And so somebody sat and they watched the airport and they realized, oh, troop movements come every, you know, Tuesday, Thursday at 6 p.m. and that's where it's going to be. So I'd like you to believe that that's really why I started to do this line of research, but the honest answer is it was a little bit spite-based. So we had a Facebook group at my old base that, uh, the network operations chief ran in his free time. And it was where families and soldiers and airmen could connect to get information and resources. Well, professionally, being a security person and him being an IT person, we often clashed on things because I would tell him he had to do something and then he would tell me I didn't have to do something, words were said, feelings were hurt, he kicked me out of his Facebook group. I didn't really love that so much. So I thought, aha, I bet I can still get in that Facebook group. And so I created an account that made me an army colonel overnight. Fantastic. Added, uh, asked for admission into the group, got approved. And then suddenly I started thinking, yikes. There's a lot of stuff we talk about in here that we assume to be in this boundary of trust that there's not really a high barrier to entry for. So then that got me thinking, 
Well, if I was an attacker and I wanted information that maybe I didn't necessarily have access to, this would be a pretty good place to start. So, now that we're talking about people, we need to talk about assets. And when I talk about assets, I'm specifically talking in the sense of an intelligence asset. And they're broken down into three categories. So you have your basic agents. Basically, these are the people who have primary access. It's the person working in the nuclear bunker that has the nuclear codes. It's the person who is working on a missile system that has you know, the information to do the launch. Things like that. Those people are very rare, right? Because there's only so many people that have access to that. And they're specifically trained to resist manipulation by foreign intelligence. So that doesn't really work for me. Then we have executive agents, and these are the ones you see in movies, and they're shooting people and blowing up buildings, and quite frankly, that's a lot more drama than I really want, so I don't really mess with that. And the third category, though, is super interesting. Access agents, people who have access to the people who have access. Now, these people are really interesting. They know a lot. They're not trained in protecting information. They're often not trained in how to avoid being approached by foreign um, intelligence services. And because of the nature of how they work, they're often much easier to manipulate. Huh, so now I know who I want to target in a broad category. But what makes a really good asset? The CIA has this framework, uh, which has since been updated, but I particularly like the old one because I'm just old school like that. They call it mice. Money, do you need money? Are you going through financial struggle? Are you perhaps in debt? Are you making risky business moves? Ideology. Maybe you're no longer so much in love with the United States and what we're doing. Maybe you don't love our current political system. Maybe you're not a fan of our president. It happens. I should probably target you then, because I bet I could change some of your touch points into how you live your life. Coercion. Is there something about you that you hope nobody ever finds out? This is very culturally and contextually dependent. I live in Seattle. We're a very progressive city. If somebody were to find out that, say, I had a sexual orientation that was different than heteronormative, not so much of a big deal to me. If I live in a country where that is ruthlessly oppressed, that's a big deal to me, right? That's a huge deal to me. I, that could lose me my life. That's a point of coercion. The final one is ego or excitement. Um, basically, are you that person that thrives on adrenaline? Do you want to feel important? Like, yeah, man, I really got that. Ugh, I know so much. And you will always find these people, by the way, if you go to security conferences, they're the ones at the bar on their seventh whiskey. It's like, well, let me tell you about the time Google got hacked because of my code. They're fun. They're a lot of fun in this category. And usually, especially, and I hate to say this, especially if you go, really? I don't know anything about Google. Could you tell me? OK. So now we have to talk about the intelligence funnel. What am I after? Well, I want something important. In this particular case, I wanted to know if I could find out troop movements. I wanted to see if I could find out where troops were moving in and out of the country. So now I need to figure out who has access to that information, predominantly soldiers and sailors. So OK, but I know they're going to be kind of tricky. So I'm going to go after maybe their spouses or friends. Now I need to figure out from that big group of people who might be actually able to be exploited. Then I'm going to go and I'm going to learn everything I can about these people. I'm going to deep dive. I'm going to know them better than they know themselves. So I'm going to create detailed documents on who they are and what they do. Then I can start my approach. This is, this is the risky part, right? So in the old days, it used to be that I would send someone to a bar that you frequented and say, hey, nice watch. I also have a nice watch. Do you also like watches? I too like watches. How about you give me your information? And they would either go, OK, or they would go, oh my gosh, run, find the police. That's where it gets risky. But now, I get to be on social media. And if you say, oh my gosh, run, call the police, I go, delete account, make a new one. Delete account, make a new one. And forever, I can just be in this constant approach. And eventually, the law of large numbers says, eventually, I'm going to find somebody who's susceptible to this. So the final one is I want to exfiltrate the data, right? Once I've found the target that's easily manipulated, who's willing to work with me, I want to get all the information they can give me and then peace out before they find out what I'm actually doing. So for those of you who don't know, Dossiers are basically the files that intelligence services or journalists keep on people of interest. Um, typically, it keeps your vitals, your name, your place of birth, uh, your weight, your eye color, you know, anything that would be in a police report if they were trying to find you. It also talks about your family associations. Um, 
mother, father, sister, brother, cousins, do you have any of those that are a potential weak spot for you? Do you have perhaps a teenage child who's been in and out of rehab that you're trying to keep under wraps? Do you have a mother who's in financial debt that you're constantly giving money to? These are things I wanna know because not only are you vulnerable, but your entire network makes you more vulnerable. Your business connections, um, you know, are you doing business with certain countries, certain governments, certain uh, companies? Do you drink with the head of Airbus? I don't know, that would be interesting information to me. Other associations, church friends, these are like your social clubs, right? Uh, maybe you go to a certain church, that helps me get more information about you. Maybe your kids go to a certain school, you support the PTA. All of this is designed so that I have a broad basis for becoming your friend. By the way, no one ever wants to talk to me after these talks, after I give this. It's fine, I, I swear I'm not the bad guy. But that's what a bad guy would say. All right, so now, I figured out kind of what I want to do, and so I just, I grabbed this because I live in the state of Washington, and I think, well, if I'm gonna hit something in Washington, I want it to be a very large military base. Um, why, do I, why do I target military people? Military people have access to a lot of information, even at a very low level. When I was 19 years old, I was in the Air Force, I had root control access for every server that controlled everything in the entire United Kingdom for the Air Force at 19. Terrifying. No one should have given me that kind of control. No one. No one should still give me that kind of control. Terrible life choices. So the other thing that's really interesting about the military is that because we're constantly changing. When I was 19, I left home and I moved to a foreign country and I didn't know anybody. And then two years later, I moved to another foreign country and I didn't know anybody and I didn't speak the language. And then two years later, I moved to a completely different place. And I was constantly changing over and saying, I don't know anyone here. So you know what that does? It makes me want to find people because we're biologically wired to seek connection. That gives me an opportunity. So figured out where I want to hit, now I can do some basic Google reconnaissance. I mean, this is nothing terribly fancy, but I can figure out where their groups are, that their operations are. Um, if you're even slightly familiar with military, uh, you can kind of figure out what these people do for a living if you look at their groups. So for example, the Special Forces group. Those are the people we put behind, you know, outside of the wire doing really gnarly stuff with bad guys. That's, you know, that's, those are people that are doing some really, really sensitive stuff. Maybe I want to look there. So now I know kind of where I want to look. What if I went to LinkedIn? By the way, I chopped all of the information out of this guy's profile because I felt so bad for using it. Um, maybe I want to, you know, go look and see what they've done. Well, this is nice. He gives me his entire work history and what he's worked on. So I know this guy's a signal guy, which means he's a comms guy, which means he probably has access to all of the tech that runs the military. That's interesting. I like that. So now I kind of know what I want. I've done some information. But where could I find a publicly indexable search engine that has all this information on people that they freely give me to play with? Ah, Facebook. Now I know nobody uses Facebook but old people, and that's fine, I'm an old people. But you'd be surprised at how many people are still on the platform. There's a lot of things that happen only on Facebook that don't happen on other platforms. But the good news is, when I first started doing these talks, you could just go to anybody's page, and it was all public. And then I did a lot of training, and I like to believe this was me, but it wasn't. It's was just the industry moved on. And now everything, you have to be their friend. And that bums me out, because that makes me work harder. And as we've already discussed, I'm lazy. So that's not so good. But thankfully, there's these things called Facebook communities. And I bet you if you go home tonight and you look at your neighborhood or your school or your church group, you will find a community that is related to that. It just so happens that in the military there are lots of them. So many, so many. And the bar to entry, not so high. But it turns out if you say, hey, I'm a super villain and I'm trying to exploit your people, would you let me join your Facebook group? They oftentimes say no. Just kind of one of those things. It's okay though. Everyone say hi to Karen. Karen's a lovely young lady. I don't know her. I found her on the internet. She is stationed at Fort Benning. Uh, she put these lovely photographs up. The reason I have covered her face is because I'm not actually using these photos with permission. So she put these up as her, her photographer came and photographed her husband's coming home. And I was able to use that to make this lovely profile page of her. These are her actual vacation photos, by the way, which I found after finding her actual Facebook profile. 
this looks pretty freaking convincing, right? I'm not sure that Karen herself would know that this isn't her page, except maybe she doesn't have a dog. I was trying to go for something innocuous. So now that I have my sock puppet, or fake account, I can start really looking into the information in these groups. So I joined a bunch of groups. And I just started searching for keywords. So here we go. This person's husband's moving. Uh, she's in, he's in Iraq. So she's lonely, most likely. She's probably without a support system. We know that he's not there, so you know she has a toddler. This is great. They live in a one-bedroom apartment. I mean, this is, this is information that I would like. Or you know, we have somebody that's coming home from deployment soon. We talk about our deployment in Afghanistan and when her husband's returning. Oh, maybe my, her husband's leaving for deployment next week. Fantastic. I bet somebody else is going with him. I bet many someone else's are going with him. There's just so much information in these groups, it's actually a little hard to process. So you really have to figure out what it is you're looking for. For me particularly, when I'm doing these types of assessments, I'm looking for troop movements, I'm looking for people who are in specific units, specific battalions that have access to specific information. So I'll tailor my searches for that. But more importantly, I want to find people that are actually susceptible to manipulation. So here's this young lady. She said, well, her husband works for the 2nd Infantry Striker Brigade, and she wants to know when and where they deploy. And this very, very, very helpful person down here says, oh, they go to North Fort, Yakima, NTC, JRTC, and every other year they go to Thailand. Great, now I know where your, your unit is moving. I can plan for that. But moreover, I really, really, really want to see if you're going to be susceptible. And this is the part where I sound like a huge jerk, but again, not the bad guy. She says she's suffering from depression. Depression, mental illness, all of these are trigger points for manipulation, or can be, especially if you're not seeking help, which especially in military communities, mental health is very largely discouraged from, getting, from actually seeking treatment. You can lose your job. I myself have suffered from depression since I was a little kid, and I was told specifically in the military that I was not allowed to seek treatment because I would be kicked out, and I watched it happen. And so people in this community are very, very you know, hesitant to talk about this, but they'll put it in a public Facebook group. I mean, technically it's private, but as you've seen, not really super private. So, okay, <laughs> now this starts getting really, this, so I have to tell you guys, when I'm doing this research, it's kind of like when you're in high school and you start hearing the really good gossip and you're like, oh, I don't even know these people. But it's like, oh my gosh, why would, why would you post this publicly? Stop. So she's going through a divorce, um, potential that the kid's not his, so they're going to do a paternity test. That seems like a pretty good uh, inflection point for me. Uh, then there's this one, divorce, same thing. She's all alone for Thanksgiving. I bet she's pretty interested in making new friends. Sounds like I'm hosting me a Thanksgiving dinner. So here's, so for those of you who don't know, uh, basic allowance for housing or BAH is a government entitlement that you get when you're married. If you are not married or if you are living apart, this is technically fraud. She's admitting to defrauding the US government on a Facebook group. I bet that's some pretty interesting information to know. All right, so now I need to make friends. So the cool thing or not so cool thing about these groups is that in them, because people are desperately trying to find connection, you'll find these posts of, I just moved here, I don't know anyone, can anyone you know, reach out to me, hang out, I just, I just wanna know someone here. And it's a very basic and normal human reaction that unfortunately can be exploited to make friends with people who may not have your best interest at heart. And then the, the interesting thing is a lot of times in these groups they'll post all the new members. So even if they're not posting asking for friends, I, know no, I now know they're new here, and they're probably looking for friends. All right, so some things to consider. When I, when I do these types of campaigns, I usually have a sock puppet account, which is my main fake account. I also have another sock puppet account that's a friend of my fake account because it turns out people don't like to make friends with people who don't have friends. It's weird. So I have a fake friend for my fake person to make real friends. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work. Now when I send these, um, I only send about 15 this time because quite honestly uh, my primary account got burned about a week before I did this talk and uh, I had to kind of step it up and create a fake one. Uh, so I got 15 out, about 30% accepted which is pretty normal. It goes up exponentially over time. Um, and the reason it does that is because as you create more content, as you get more friends, as you accept more friends, people tend to believe you more. I am much more willing to accept a Facebook request from somebody who has six mutual connections 
than no mutual connections. And if you're in the same Facebook group, odds are somebody in that group knows somebody in that group who's also a mutual connection. Um, the interesting thing about this is then the more you do this, the more friend requests you send in a short amount of time. And as I said, I was very pressed to do this because I was trying to get content ready. I, w I went too far. I went too fast. And so I started getting messages like these. I'm sorry, I don't know you. Who are you? No one. I'm just going to fade into the background. I was never here. So she unfriended me, her cousin unfriended me, and then like two people that she knew unfriended me. It was terrible. Um, that's kind of one of the things you do. You can go and have a really like, good account, but it takes time. You can have kind of an eh account if you want to go really fast. Um, when you have these sock puppet accounts, it's very important to make them seem real. And what do I mean by that? Join groups, especially local groups. You know, I like, I like Tacoma. Tacoma happens to be near, nearish to one of the bases. I like soccer. I like ACDC. Whatever it is, this makes you seem like a more well-rounded person. You have to start posting actual content, commenting on other people's. This is an investment of time. The people that I know that do this full-time as like their job, they spend an inordinate amount of time maintaining their you know, 20 to 30 sock puppet accounts. I was actually talking to a gentleman who does this full-time, and he said he spent between 20 and 30 hours every week just sort of feeding his sock puppets. You know, just making sure they looked real enough not to get flagged. Um, what I like to do is I, I have a bunch of like inspirational posts because it turns out that all of us post the same crap to Facebook. Whatever you do in life, know that the people who have your back love you. Hashtag same. It's, right, like this makes you real because everyone has posted that exact same quote a hundred times. And they're easy. I don't have to come up with like actual original content. I can just, you know, say really cliche things and people think that I'm just really cliche, which I actually really am. Um, I also really need to be methodical in how I build these accounts and I build them for specific purposes. They have their own persona and their own backstory. Uh, Karen, for example, is a military spouse. I did that specifically because I was targeting military spouses. If I was targeting active duty members, I would have a specific account that was a military like my, uh, my colonel, a guy that got burned, unfortunately. People respond to that because I had my, my official Air Force photo with my official Air Force uniform and my official flag in the background. I mean, that's legit. How can you argue with that? It's right there. All right. So now this is where things start to get a little murky. Turns out there's a very fine line between reconnaissance and active solicitation. Reconnaissance is I'm just sort of passively obtaining this information. I'm stalking Facebook groups, and I'm sort of looking at people and gathering information. Maybe I'm doing Google, uh, Google dorks. Maybe I'm stalking them across other platforms. But then there comes this point, if I were a federal, or I'm sorry, a foreign information service, that I would cross, where now I'm going to start reaching out to you. Now I'm going to start sending you a friend request. I'm going to start sending you messages. I'm going to start talking to the people in your lives and that's where you kind of cross some really unfortunate boundaries. That becomes solicitation. And in many countries, that starts to fall afoul of their espionage laws. Because if I were to friend request Ellen, when she worked at Microsoft, we both used to work at Microsoft, and said, hey, could you give me the source code for Windows 10? Because we're cool, right? And she said, sure. Well, now I've just committed corporate espionage, even if it was just under the guise of research. Now I have an ethical duty to tell Microsoft, hey, you might want to watch that one. So that's why you, if you're going to do this, and I recommend that you don't, this is my warning for everyone, don't ask for information you don't want to have. Don't ask for information you could be legally barred from obtaining. I'm not a lawyer nor a spy, but I will tell you that you definitely do not want people in suits coming to visit you and asking you why you're doing this line of research. So, some real world examples. The, the universe was kind to me as I came here, and they left me this gift. So it turns out a bunch of Hamas um, operatives were using fake women to get Israeli members of the IDF to install this chat app that looks very similar to WhatsApp that then went on to install spyware in their phones that was recording constantly and taking pictures and doing who knows what. These are things that are actually happening. This is not something that I make up just because I have weird hobbies. 
right? These are things that people are actually doing. They targeted them using social media. They targeted them using specific information about them that was publicly available. And there's a bunch of these. And these literally took me maybe 30 seconds to find. These are just sort of the three most prominent ones that I'm aware of. Um, the one I couldn't find, uh, I couldn't find the actual article. There was a woman who targeted a bunch of military contractors on LinkedIn. And she was able to get base plans, plans for like aircraft carriers. I mean, it was truly shocking how much people were willing to give her based on LinkedIn, based on messages that they'd been sharing. So this is something that really does happen to people. But right about now, you're thinking, I don't work in the military. I don't have access to nukes. I don't have access to aircraft carriers. And nobody cares, Tracy. Nobody cares about this. This is not relevant to me. Funny you should mention that. So apparently at this university, you folks do a lot of research. Interesting. I wonder if anything you're doing is useful and interesting, potentially dangerous. I wonder if any of you are researching cryptography, science, health, and epidemic outbreaks. I wonder if any of you are working on trusted computing systems. I bet you are. I bet you have information that I could use. So yes, this absolutely applies to more people than you would think. And even if it doesn't apply to you personally, I will bet it applies to someone you know. Now that you're sitting here, I want you to think through all of your family contacts and your friends and your cousins. I'm a little bit odd because I've been in tech now for a really long time. And I, I, I seem to know everyone at every company now. I don't know, it's like a weird thing. Once you get to a certain age, you just eventually know every, everybody at every company. Except Airbus, so I'm going to find Alexander after this. Um, I haven't actually met anybody from Airbus yet, but I know lots of people at Boeing. Um, so when you think through that, think about what information they might have. Maybe your mother works at you know, a technology, a, te a telco company here in Portugal. Maybe she has access to some of their core infrastructure. Maybe your father works for you know, Portuguese national defense. Maybe your cousin has, is at a university that's doing research into hazmat containment and virus outbreaks. There's a lot of things that people forget because it starts to seem so normal. It seems normal to me that I've worked at most of the top 100 companies in tech. It just seems normal to me. And I grew up definitely where that was not normal. But the more you're exposed to it, the more normal it becomes. So what does this mean for you? Now you're all bummed out. Now you guys are going to go home and you know, delete all your social media profiles and never talk to anyone again. And that's not the message of this talk. These are necessary things and necessary platforms. And the desire to connect is neither wrong, nor should it be avoided. We, as humans, need these connections to survive. It is a fundamental part of our biology. But just like fire is a fundamental part of how we consumed cooked foods, we should be a little careful with it. So anyone in this room can be an access agent. Anyone could be approached for even the most silly reasons. Those with access to technology, medicine, infrastructure, data source, anything. Maybe you just have the code to unlock the door where the research is held. Maybe you don't even do the research. So with that, I really want you to start thinking about, to Ellen's point, your threat model. What do I know, what do I have access to that other people might be interested in, and how can I protect against that? All right. Understand how all of your pieces fit together, not just you, your family, your friends, your connections, your university affiliation, your job, you know, your church, whatever it is. Think about how all of those things fit together to make you who you are and threat model accordingly. Think about your mice. Are you going through anything that could be potentially used against you? If somebody approaches you and says, hey, I have this get rich quick scheme, I bet you'd be interested. And it's a little close to home. Maybe wonder if that's the best thing for you. Um, talk to your family, and I, I usually give this talk to information security professionals, and the reason I put this in there is it turns out that information security professionals are really good at talking at people and less good at talking to people. So we all sit around in our bars late at night and go, man, users are the worst. Turns out we never actually talk to those users. Ellen's laughing because she's heard me say this. Um, so go home and talk to your family. If you've learned something today, go home and talk to your mom, to your dad, to your kids. Say, hey, be careful what you're sharing on social media because it can increase your exposure. 
be wary of unknown friends. I'm not saying don't accept them, but maybe do some, there's some really great articles on how to spot a disinformation account. That's a whole separate talk, but educate yourself. Uh, figure out you know, what those accounts look like and what they might be trying to get from you. Treat anything, and I say Facebook groups on here. I know we always say this. Treat everything communicated over the internet as public. Yes, that includes those apps that supposedly delete themselves. You know which ones I'm talking about. Nothing is deleted, everything is forever. Just be mindful of that. And if you choose to share that, great. That means I trust that you've done an adequate threat model and you understand your exposure. All right. Here's your first OSINT challenge. You ready? No one's ready. No one's ready. No, really? You've learned nothing from this talk. You're not excited about OSINT at all. I'll go home. It's fine. All right, so you can find me on social media. I'm on many social media platforms. I purposely did not include it here. You're welcome to connect with me. Um, Facebook, I don't accept friend requests for obvious reasons, but on any of the other social media platforms, you're welcome to connect with me. And for anyone who connects with me and leaves a comment, I'm giving away the Humble Bundle book set that just came out uh, from No Starch Press, which actually has the threat modeling book that Ellen referenced and a really great social engineering book, uh, as well as a couple of other goodies if you're looking to jumpstart your, uh, your cybersecurity education. This is a, a really good way to go. All right, I think that is it. Does anyone have questions? No one. You... All right. <laughs>